January, given there, there are three Sundays between now and then, between now and the end of January, where we're not going to meet for various reasons. So we'll probably go into February. So uh, on the Facebook page, I've put a tentative schedule. So if you wanted to go there, uh, I don't know if it's on the website or not, and I'll come next week with a, a schedule of the questions. And if oh, I won't, I won't next week because next week's one of the one of the weeks we're not meeting. That's right. We are we are not meeting next week. One of these days, I'll bring a schedule. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to try to address two questions. The first one I think I can deal with fairly quickly. The other one perhaps not so quickly. The, the first question I want to look at is, the, it, the person worded it like this. I know funerals often cite a passage that says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Is there any problem with cremation? Does this mean we don't need to be whole after death to be returned to bodily persons in heaven. And the other question, which is going to take a little bit more time, is what is Israel's role in eschatology, that is, the study of the last things or final things, Israel's role in the second coming, the end of the world, political issues of the world with people seeing Israel as the center, and why? So, first, cremation. Uh, the simple answer is, uh, yes, you can be cremated. There is no theological reason uh, why you shouldn't be or couldn't be. And actually, if there was a problem, that raises a whole host of issues. Uh, not to mention the fact of what happens to all the victims from 9-11. Uh, are they just like, what you know, are they just doomed? Uh, Certainly a belief in God and the, the Bible's teaching in Genesis that God creates out of nothing. God doesn't need something to use in order to create. We do, okay, chemists working in a lab, and I'm not a chemist, but I know that they can create new chemicals or new things, but they don't do it out of nothing. They have to use other stuff uh, to make it happen. So it raises serious questions about God as creator and maker of all things, of everything that is seen and unseen. John the Baptist, uh, in a rebuke to the leaders of Israel, said that God could raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Now that's not to say that God needs stones in order to do it, but the point being that God can do anything he wants. Now, the deeper, the deeper part of this question goes to the Roman Catholic history of liturgy and practice, which is not the same as the theological question of whether God can resurrect us even if there's nothing left to work with. Cremations were never officially forbidden in the Roman Catholic Church and they really it couldn't be because how did people deal with the plague they burned the bodies that's how you dealt with pestilence in the in antiquity so uh, there are all kinds of problems uh, with it but liturgically and this is the Roman Catholic Church has more or less insisted that cremation be used as a last resort for sacramental and liturgical reasons, but not theological ones. Not because of a belief that God needs a body to work with, but that in Roman Catholic theology, the body is theologically significant because it is the container of blessing. It is the body that receives the sacraments, and it is the body that receives blessing from God. In Roman Catholic theology, the ashes then are a symbol of the body's corrupt state. So, hence, ashes to ashes. So liturgically, liturgically, the presence of a body is an important symbol. To that I say, bunk. 
even as a liturgical and sacramental issue, the body's significance as a vessel for the sacraments, it ends at death. Okay, it is simply no longer the case that a body is necessary to house God's blessing uh, after death. The dead are with the Lord and they await their full entrance uh, into the Lord with all the rest of us. Uh, and there will be no Holy Eucharist in heaven. Why? Because God will be all in all. Uh, fair warning to those of you who are wed to a particular lit liturgical style or rite or all of that stuff because you're in for a rude awakening when you get to heaven. Okay, there will be no churches. Thank God. <laughs> Because God will be all in all, as, as scripture puts it. So, uh, any other questions about that? Anything that, secondary questions that that raised? Yes? Where does the phrase ashes to ashes come from? Oh, do you remember where that comes from? Because I don't, I don't. I don't know. Well, I'll have, to, I'll have to go back and look. I'll have to go back. The question is, where does the, the, the term ashes to ashes, dust to dust come from? Uh, I mean, God forms us from the dust, and out of the dust we come. I mean, somewhere it's somewhere there in, in Scripture. Yeah. But, you know, it, I think it's basically the Roman Catholic theology of the, the, the body returns to its... Well, they use the word corrupt, and I, I, I can't tell you that Roman, Roman Catholicism by corrupt means evil. It means into its original, you know, into its uncorporal state. But I'll, I, I'll have to go look into that. Yeah. In Genesis, they talk about creating Adam and Eve from, from the earth. Right. And from the, the earth. earth is what I've That's correct. Thank you. Well, and, and it, I think uh, uh, Don is right. It's basically a reference to the, the story of creation of Adam and Eve in Genesis. But liturgically, where it cropped up, I, I don't remember. Um, just to go back to Don's point, uh, there is one place in Genesis specifically where dust and ashes are mentioned, and that's in Genesis 18:27. It's when Abra it's when the angels come to Abraham and he start uh, he and Sarah find out they're gonna be a parent and then Abraham says uh, looks at Sodom and Gomorrah and looks at the mess that's out there and he says Lord if there are a hundred righteous people would you save Sodom and Gomorrah and the Lord says yes and then he keeps bargaining down 50 25 well he then says since I've begun let me speak further to my Lord even though I am but dust and ashes, and so forth. That's the only place where I'm getting old words together. Hmm. But there may be more. I'm just wondering if ashes to ashes, that's in the Bible, or if it's liturgical. Well, it, it is in the Bible, but like everything liturgical, we tend to weave it into liturgy in, in a way that loses its original biblical context. Uh, I, I think it's simply a statement about our created nature. We are creatures. Now, the more difficult question, what is Israel's role in eschatology, the second coming, the end of the earth? And uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of liberty and, and at first I'm gonna rephrase the question a little bit and ask a more broader question, what is Israel's role in God's future? And that will include the second coming. And as far as the end of the earth is concerned, if I don't make it explicit enough as I go along, I'll just say right now up front, there is no end of the earth in Judeo-Christian eschatology. I've tried to make this point uh, again and again. Uh, in, for example, uh, the prophet Amos and Jeremiah, 
they talk about this terrible day of Yahweh, but what makes it so fearful and appalling is that there's a day after that. And that's the what everyone needs to be worried about. Uh, so I need to stress again, and I will continue to do so, that the future, God's future for his creation does not include its destruction. It is its renewal and the joining, ultimately, of heaven and earth. So, the broader question of Jewish, let's just talk about Jewish eschatology. And again, eschatology, uh, remember Carolyn said that, uh, that this means words, uh, this is words about the end, whatever that might mean. And I think that, that this is what get, creates the confusion that the end means the destruction of this world, but that's not, it, it just means the end of the created order as we understand it. But it means that it isn't going to be destroyed, it means that something else is going to take its place. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I suppose that the, the, the point was maybe that the analogy with eschatology is like a commencement in high school, which is the ending of one period of time in, in a person's life and, and entrance into something new. And yeah, I, I, like, I like that analogy. You know, as, as, as any analogy goes, they all have their, their con, pros and cons. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I think that'll work. Now. Jewish eschatology is intimately wrapped up in, well, actually, there, there are three components to Jewish eschatology. And the, I'm only going to be able to go over these briefly. Eschatology is, I mean, this is like a whole seminary course could be taught on eschatology. So I'm really trying to do the cliff notes here. Jewish monotheism intimately wrapped up in the notion of the creator God. There is one God who creates everything. So this is monotheism. Now closely related to that in terms of Jewish eschatology is the second point that this one creator God has chosen or elected to enter into a covenantal thank you a covenantal relationship with who Israel well who we we know today is Israel so covenantal uh, the creator god creation the Creator God creates everything, and this Creator God called or has elected Israel to be His people. And if there is one God, and if this God is the God of Israel, then given the state of affairs in the world and in Israel, this God must do something in the future to put things right. If he doesn't, then Jewish theology as a whole is called into question. So, and when we speak of eschatology, one of the interesting things about it is when we're talking about the future, we are strangely talking about not just your future, my future, Israel's future, but God's future. God's future is connected to this. So somehow, whatever God has in mind for the future must be somehow tied into this. Somehow it can't lose sight of that. Israel's belief in the one creator God 
means that not only is he capable of, he is also committed to acting in the future. Specifically against pagan idols, their devotees, and when he does act, he will, that will, that act will constitute new creation. The Bible uses language of, in that day, the lion and the lamb will lay down together. Genesis 3, which is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden, is reversed in Jewish eschatology. So the exile from the garden becomes the return into God's presence. And into that picture are literally dozens upon dozens of Old Testament passages. What, need, who, what needed to be set right and who? Well, that's a good question. God had plenty of quarrels to pick with Israel. But at the end of the day, it was the wickedness of the pagan world and the dark forces that stood behind it that God was principally concerned. Prophet Jeremiah, he had a lot to say about Israel's wickedness, of, uh, wickedness, of, wickedness and God's judgment upon it. He had a lot to say about that. But at the end of the book, it is Babylon that receives the greatest condemnation. There would come a day of Yahweh. Anyone remember how Yahweh is spelled? Yahweh, no vowels in, no, no vowels in Hebrew. Which makes you wonder, how do you know how it's pronounced? Well, it's a guess. It's an educated guess. Probably something like Yahweh. Uh, some of the prophets turn the lens more fully on Israel than on pagans. For example, Amos. Uh, Amos, uh, in chapter 518, says, Why do you, Israel, desire the day of Yahweh? It is a day of darkness, not light. The post-exilic prophets like uh, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi... The post-exilic prophets, by the way, being those prophets who were living at the time of the return of the Jews from exile in Babylon into Jerusalem. And that, by the way, wasn't like a, a, a date that you could pick. It happened over a long period of time. They slowly returned. And they lived with this interesting paradox where Israel seems to have been redeemed evidenced by their return to the Holy Land, and yet they're emphatically not redeemed because while they're back in the land, Yahweh has not returned to the temple. The prophet Malachi, seeing the corruption in priests and people, declares that Yahweh will return. He, this is a post-exilic prophet, right? They're already back. And yet Malachi is saying that, that Yahweh will return, and he will return with ferocious power. The prophet Haggai, the, the, only forward, the only way forward is for Yahweh to shake heaven and earth and the sea and the land. Haggai 2, verse, chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, imagines like cosmic quake, if you will, out of which the world... A, the world emerges, a new world emerges, one that is put right, one that, is, that has a purified Israel, a glorified Jerusalem and temple, and a true Davidic king. The majority of Jews in the post-exilic period understood their age in which they lived as they were people living within a long story in search of an ending. That story often described in terms of continuing exile, even despite their geographical return to the Holy Land. So when we get to the first century, when the first century Jews thought of God's future, of a coming end of whatever sort, they definitely did not see it as something coming out of the blue. But it would be the climax of a story that they had been that had been unfolding both in the mind of God and in the real, on-the-ground history of Israel. This end would be 
the end of Israel's enslavement to pagan rulers and powers. And it was often conceived of in terms of a new exodus. An exodus on a grand scale. Pagan rulers be, be put on notice. Israel, be comforted. But the ultimate comfort will come when, the, when Yahweh returns to his temple. When that day happens, it's not only a day of judgment, it is also the day when he saves his chosen people. Now, there are several themes within Jewish eschatology, and I, I can only sort of touch on them a little bit. And there are lots of themes, and depending on what you're reading, you might come into some or more of these themes, usually not all at once. You won't necessarily find them in all in one place. But some of them, and these should sound a little bit familiar, one we've already talked about, the day of Yahweh, which uh, becomes the, or is the day of the Lord, We've got, this is my symbol for kingdom of God. And we got victory over evil and pagan rule. We've got themes of rescue, specifically of Israel. Uh, and the end of exile. The Messiah, we've got themes of new exodus, and within all of this is a belief in resurrection, that the end, whatever it meant, however that worked, meant that all of God's people would be resurrected. That would be the sure sign that new creation had arrived, that heaven and earth had come together. And all of this will be God's future in the sense that he will come into his own and he will be the king in a new way. He will be king over all the earth. How that was to happen and what it would mean in practice remained a puzzle, a mystery for most Jews. That it would happen was the inescapable corollary of monotheism and election. So it's into that that we have to look at Christian eschatology. Most uh, prominently uh, discussed by who? Paul in the New Testament. Jewish eschatology included Messiah, new creation, the uniting of Yahweh to his people or of heaven and earth, the followers of Jesus, I think if you, as we read through the Gospels in each liturgical year, you probably can tell that they're getting glimpses of these themes, some of them in Jesus. Sometimes you have the, they have these moments of insight, aha, uh -huh. Peter says, you are the Christ, <laughs> but he's, then he doesn't get it. And he's one minute later told to get behind Jesus because he's acting like Satan. And what, whatever glimpse they had in Jesus, I cannot emphasize strongly enough that it was dashed, absolutely smitten across the rocks like a shipwreck the day that he was crucified. And then came the totally unexpected and stunning event. Jesus was raised from the dead. And fundamentally, 
if you're wondering, we, we, we talk about, you know, what's, a, what's miraculous? The virgin birth, as you see in my article for the Courier today, or this, this month, or the resurrection. The resurrection is a much more difficult one to believe, and here's the thing. It is virtually, from a historic point of view, from a, from a history point of view, from a historian's point of view, it becomes virtually impossible to explain the rise of Christianity without something having happened in Jesus that was completely unexpected. If that tomb wasn't empty, we really got a whole lot to figure out because there just isn't any way to explain how it happened. It was completely unexpected and Paul maintained because of the resurrection that in fact in Christ God's own future had burst into the present and that in Christ Israel's future had come to pass. Now Paul did that through what in Jewish eyes would have been an astonishing, scandalous interpretation of Jesus' crucifixion as not a defeat, but a victory of God over evil. And it was the crucifixion that was the evidence that pagan powers had been defeated. Okay, some of these themes. Paul is saying, look, this, this happened already, Israel. This has happened. And that means that this is here. And Jesus was raised from the dead. That means, oh my gosh, we've, we've seen the new exodus. We've seen the end of the exile. Paul began to put all of these together and was trying to say that all of the hope that Israel had for the future, all of these themes for their future with God had actually happened in the resurrection of Jesus. The twist is that Paul creatively wove together the tension between that event that had happened through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus and the end that was still to come. In Christian eschatology, we, from Paul, when theologians talk about Christian eschatology, they usually, always use word, language of now but not yet now, here but not yet here, happen but there's still more to come. Uh, a lot of theology in the 19th and 20th century came from German theologians and I can't remember now that there's a term for not yet. Anyone know German? What's the German for not yet? Anyway, that, that, was a, that was a word that was thrown around in theology. What? That sounds very close. Uh, very close. Anyway, the point is that it's not yet. It's here, but not yet here. That is, God's new creation is here, and you know it's here because of the resurrection of Jesus. Somehow, heaven and earth has been joined in Jesus, in his resurrection, but there's also a not yet quality to it. So for Paul, his redefined eschatology in the Messiah was that what Israel expected God to do for all his people at the end of time, God had done for his people through the Messiah in the middle of time. So that's an enormous theme. I can't go into all of it, but in broad brushstrokes from a Christian perspective, all of the key themes of Jewish eschatology had been reshaped around Jesus. The resurrection, Messiahship, the arrival of God's kingdom, which, by the way, is nowhere near as central in Paul as, as it is in the Gospels. But if you want to take a closer look at some of this stuff, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul refers to the kingdom in a future way. In Romans 14, 17, he talks about it as a present reality. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 to 29, he's, he uses both present and future language when talking about the kingdom. Paul talks about the defeat of pagan powers in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 10, and Colossians 2, 14 to 15. In, in Romans 5, 
uh, he speaks of Jesus' obedience and the subsequent reign of God and his grace. In, in Romans 5, Paul is talking about the rule of sin and death versus the rule of God's grace. Paul believes the new exodus has been launched through Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about our ancestors being baptized into Moses through what? The Red Sea. Okay, this is an, clearly a parallel to being baptized into Christ. And as we will hear in a few moments at the next service, for those of you who are sticking around for the baptism, when we pray over the water, the prayer includes, uh, through it you led the people of God out of bondage in Egypt. The pinnacle of Paul's eschatology, I think, is in Romans 6, 8 to us. Uh, Romans 6 to 8, chapter 6 to 8, where the entire Exodus theme is applied to the people of God in Christ. So God's people have come through the waters of baptism, which have delivered them from slavery and into freedom. Paul writes, we are no longer slaves of sin. And when he uses this slavery image, he's hearkening to their slavery in Egypt. Again, the point being, that within Paul, there's this theme of new exodus. So with the promise of resurrection before them, the people of God, Christians, are launched into the journey of the Christian life led by the Spirit, which is reminiscent, if you're a Jew, of being led through the wilderness by the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. And you're led through that and through the wilderness to home, the promised land, or the renewal of all creation. So what then of the still to come eschatology? Well, remember we've talked about this. In the creed, we, we say he will come again. So by way of reminder, let me just uh, say once again, as forcefully as I can, and this I think gets now to at least in part, the original question of what is Israel's role, and I assume by that question, the question is, what is the present day state of Israel's role in eschatology? And at least in part, that is coming from this misinterpretation of 1 Thessalonians and the Left Behind series in particular which is thoroughly un-Jewish. And the irony of its thorough, thorough un-Jewishness is that in this series of left, the Left Behind series, there is this fanatical and bizarre support for the present day state of Israel. But it's un-Jewish because the Left Behind series, what it does is creates this dualism where the present wicked world is left to stew in its own juices while the saints are snatched up into heaven. Yeah. There are fatherland over in the Middle East and the people, I think. I think it's both. It's a both and. Uh, that, that somehow the Zion, the location of the Holy Land and where the temple was, which now only, we, we only have what? The, what is it called? The Western Wall? It's the only thing left uh, of the temple, that the temple will be re, rebuilt. Uh, this is very, shall we say, Messianic Jew, Jewish imagery of still waiting for a coming Messiah who will build, rebuild God's temple. Now, Paul's take on the future eschatology of Christ has four components, and we've already talked about some of them in another class. There is the day of the Lord, the parousia. Remember we talked about the parousia? The, the, the parousia having to do with Christ's royal appearing. And you remember how in 1 Thessalonians, there's this imagery of, of God's people rising up to meet him but that the fuller image is one that comes out of the Roman world where the Roman emperor came to town 
you would go out to meet him, not to stay there, but to escort him back into his land. We talked also about judgment. Uh, that is bringing God's wise judgment in order to all creation. And then there is the renewal of creation. So those, those four things, day of the Lord, the parousia, judgment, and the renewal of all creation. All of that Paul deals with. Now any questions about, about this so far? I mean, the bottom line answer to the question is, Israel doesn't have a role, if by that we mean the present state of Israel literally. The, the lo and its location in the Holy Land. But if we're talking about Israel's, the, Israel's theology, all right, let's go back to where we started. And let me try to draw this all together. What did we say? We said that there is the Creator God, and there's only one who created all things, and this God elected Israel. Now, I know you know this, so this is not a trick question. What has the resurrection of Jesus and baptism done to this? To who? To what? Exactly right. A new covenant has been created. With a new, with a, a, a new people. And the New Testament word for these people, we talked about saints, but that's not the word. the church. And at this point, we have to work overtime to tell our brains to quit revolving around an institution and get back to the concept of the church as the elected people through baptism of God. So that if, if in Jewish eschatology, Israel very much has something to do with eschatology, and I think that that would be fair. Outside of the Messiah, if you assume that there has been no Messiah, then the original question of what is the role of Israel with God's eschatology in terms of the present state of Israel, well, there's a lot to do with it, all right, from a Jewish point of view. But from the Christian point of view, the new, this is Israel. Everyone who's been baptized. And so if Israel has, has a role in eschatology apart from the Messiah, then now the church has a role, an important role to play in eschatology. You're following me? Yeah. That might get me a little bit off topic. Okay. Uh, let, let, let me. Let, I'm watching the Old Testament, God calling the prophets, God calling the prophets. Right. Back, you know, right. Um, I thought they seemed like he was trying in different ways to call people to him. Right. Um, but then decided he better come and reveal himself. <laughs> Here, yeah. Um, let me come back to that. Okay. Let me come back to that. That's interesting. That you're in, that's very interesting that you're asking that question because I think about this kind of stuff all the time. Let me, let me try to paint a picture of how to conceive us as the church in the overall biblical story. I don't think this is going to answer your question, but it might begin to touch on it. <clears throat> my, uh, my son, Nick, called me the other day uh, from a car that he was riding in with some of his colleagues, and they had somehow gotten into an uh, argument 
about Genesis. And uh, someone in the, one of the friends, Nick's friends, noted that there sure does seem to be two creation stories in Genesis. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Nick calls me while they're driving, and I'm like on speakerphone. You know? <laughs> and uh, what I said was, you know, I, I think that what happens is Christians, they, they tend to look at the Bible, I think, incorrectly, as if, you know, it is the Word of God, but it's not like it's all on the same playing field. And the way to think about that is to think of the history of God's interaction with people like a play, okay? So that I submit to you that there may be five acts. Act one is creation. Almost immediately, act two is the fall. Creation, fall, act three is the story of Israel, B.C., before Christ. Act four is Jesus. Act five is Easter and So that we do not, we do not live here, but we are living where Act 1 is part of the story, but we're no longer in Act 1. We don't live in Act 2, but we live in a world that we're this was part of the play. This is part of the story. I mean, you can't understand where we're living if you don't understand that this stuff, but we're no longer there. And to imagine that, to imagine that we, for example, live in, the, in Act 1 in the, in the current moment might lead to a very uncritical acceptance of everything in the world because God created it all. I said this very recently to some colleagues in a, in a clergy group, and I found myself almost immediately wanting to say, but I'm, what I said was is that, you know, God created everything, and that means that nothing in and of itself is unspiritual. But then I said, but, but that doesn't mean that everything helps that spirituality. That, that the things in the world can help or hinder it. Because we no longer live in that period of time. We don't want to get idealistic about it. On the other hand, we no longer live uh, in the fall. To think that we do, I think, leads to the kind of dualism where the earth is this wicked place and the whole goal of the Christian life is to escape it and get somewhere else. Remember, Gnostics believe that. That's not orthodox. The story of Israel BC, we don't live there. To think that we do may lead to this sort of weird dispensationalism where, the Jew, where, where we have sort of a Jewish Christianity. Uh, and, and to do that, we have to ignore, for example, the entire book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Act four is Jesus of Nazareth. We don't live here either. But we do live in the play of which we, the church, are formed precisely as the people for whom the life ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus are the fourth act. Where we live, I submit to you, is here. Easter and beyond. That Jesus rose from the dead. And the early task, if you will, you can think of uh, Act 5. There have been a lot of scenes since then, but we're still in Act 5. Uh, the early story involved the, uh, guy, the story of Jesus and, and people writing down that story in such a way as to form the basic parameters of what it means to be a follower. Now, I hate to do this because I, 
But remember we talked about orthodoxy. I think the early, the early centuries of the church are what created these parameters within which we as Christians are living out our day and uh, to borrow from uh, N.T. Wright, we improvise our way through this act. But hold on to your hats here for a second because I'm going to explain imp improvisation in a moment. So we live in this period of time where the church is, co is in theory cooperating with God as we move towards God's future. God will ultimately bring it about, but we have a part to play in it. We don't build the kingdom, but we build for the kingdom. Remember, I've used that language here before. So here's the thing about improvisation. I'm not a musician, I wish Carolyn were here. No musician would suppose that improvising means playing out of tune or out of time. On the contrary, it means knowing extremely well where one is within the implicit structure and listening intently to the, to the other players so that what they do, they all do together, however spontaneously, that makes sense as a whole. The uniquely American uh, music form called jazz would be the example. What, what, what? So I've been given the time sign. She, uh, the, she just came in. So let me just say very quickly, um, I think we're living in a time, and my, my critique of our time is that we're living in a, and we're witnessing where the wrong kind of improvisation is going on. Where people and churches and leaders are simply declaring that whatever they're doing to be of the spirit and then daring anyone to challenge them. And it's the wrong kind of improvisation precisely because of the lack of knowledge of where we are in the implicit structure of Easter in terms of its beginning with Christ and his resurrection and its end as say defined in Revelations or in Ephesians 1 or in Colossians 1. Churches decline and decline and decline while some are screaming social justice as if the task of the church is to actually uh, take on the end times and bring it in ourselves or we scream sacred cows in our churches as if we have no part to play in actively building for God's future. So, I don't know if that answered your question, but ultimately the answer is not, in Christian terms, Israel's role, but it's ours. And we have one. Amen, and write your questions down where they're hot, and bring them in in two weeks. We can, we'll try to, de we'll try to or watch the video, and, and then Write it down. If I, didn't, if I said something like you're just totally lost, try to write it down. I'm doing the best I can. I saw a lot of blank faces today. All right, I got to go.